Welcome to the Behavior Groups Podcast. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with interesting people in order to unlock insights into behavioral science and how we can apply them to work and life. Caroline Webb is not an underachiever. She is an Oxford undergrad, she went to Cambridge for graduate school, and she was a research fellow at the Levy Economics Institute, and then she joined McKenzie & Associates, where she consulted on some really incredible projects. We had the luck to interview her about her wonderful book, How to Have a Good Day, and discovered that there's much more to Caroline than just writing a wonderful how-to guide that has now been published in more than 60 countries. Yeah, she is absolutely an overachiever and just a delightful conversation conversationalist as well. Caroline splits her time between speaking at conferences like the Davos World Economic Forum, Mm. uh, consulting with global 1,000 companies, and singing at Carnegie Hall in New York City, where she now resides. How to Have a Good Day is a monstrous book, and we highly encourage you to check it out. Not only is it filled with great ideas with big aha moments, she's great at prodding you with the and then bullet points and summaries. Our conversation with Caroline spent some time on how having a good day at work can be positively influenced by primes, those somewhat tiny subconscious triggers that we have that can influence our subsequent behavior, like socks. Socks? Socks. Socks. You know, socks can be primes. I think we've talked about this. We talk about it all the damn time. Are you, <laughs> what's, what kind of socks are you wearing right now? I'm wearing my beer drinking socks. They have little things of beers and uh, anyway. Okay, we also talked about goals and how personal and very specific goals make a huge difference in our work and how it's important to have both large scale and these small specific goals to really maximize our return. Right. We talked to her about a, a component that she talked about, the personal why, and which is really about intrinsic motivation and that how that is so key to being motivated. She gave some really practical ways uh, in order to enhance your intrinsic motive motivation, even when that task at hand isn't always fun. We also talked about why it's important to have a devil's advocate in your life, Tim. (laughs) Back to Carnegie Hall, I just want to say that this year Caroline's performing a rendition of Handel's Messiah, and that she comes from a long line of musicians in her family. Um, And she let us know that while she does use Donna Summer's I Feel Love as a prime, She also has dozens of primes for different priming soundtracks for different effects and different reasons, okay? It's not just Donna Summer. But she doesn't use socks, so that's not her thing. But anyway, we we digress. We should send her some socks. We should. There we go. On a note, um, we had some technical difficulties with our first interview with Caroline, but she must have liked us enough or she was just feeling sorry enough for us that she granted us a full second interview. So what you are hearing today is that second one. So with that, please sit back and with your favorite recording of some Western European Baroque music. You know what they say, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. That was a Tim line. (laughs) Just sit back and enjoy our conversation with the multi-talented, overachieving Caroline Webb. Caroline Webb, welcome to the Behavioral Groups Podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It is great to have you here. It really is. We uh, This is just for our listeners, uh, for, for the sake of full disclosure, we had some technical difficulties on our first uh, interview with Caroline, and this is we're excited to be uh, returning to the scene of the crime. <laughs> Super excited. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're going to get started with the speed round. Kurt, do you want to start with uh, the speed round? Yeah, I think this is going to be unfair because she's already had a preview of these if she can remember back for a couple of weeks, but we'll start. Here we go. All right, Caroline, unicycle or bicycle? Oh, bicycle. I used to love uh, riding my bicycle with no hands on the handlebar as a kid. So, awesome. yeah, absolutely. Ooh, <laughs> no hands. Okay. Yeah. Would, you, would you prefer to get eight hours sleep bef- the, uh, the night before the big exam or would you study all night? Oh, always eight hours sleep. I, I'm not sure I always did that, actually, when I was a student. But absolutely now, as a grown-up, knowing all the research, no question, eight hours sleep. <laughs> Great. New Milton or New York? <laughs> you can't say that. New Milton is where I grew up. Uh, you know, that's that's part of my DNA. But I, I do love New York, you know, despite my accent. Uh, you know, I, that is where I live, and, and it's really become a fantastic home. So thank you, New York. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Okay, so would you rather sing in the choir at Carnegie Hall or do a solo performance at Carnegie's Deli? 
Well, so that's a sneaky question. So I do sing at Carnegie Hall twice a year as part of a chorus. So yeah, you know, I, I've got to say I, I love that. It's just a, it's a great performance energy um, from from the whole space there. So yes, there we are. I'm busted. <laughs> my, my side gig. My side gig. Well, we love the fact that you sing at Carnegie Hall. I mean, that is just a, there are very few people, I think, around the world that can actually say that. So it, it's a, it's a wonderful yeah. testament. So, yeah, it's a pretty, I you think it's a pretty. You haven't heard me sing, though. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, I might be just hiding behind all of my chorus mates. So that's how I sing in a choir. I just mouth the words and, and then the, the, the choir sounds good. So. <laughs> Well, we absolutely have to come back to that. Uh, that's uh, that's definitely going to be a part of our conversation. Uh, and Kurt, whether you like it or not, I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, but let's 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 start by um, should we start talking about the book a little bit? I think How to Have a Good Day is is a terrific read. Honestly, I was just so delighted as a bullet point guy myself. I was so delighted to see your very generous use of bullet points. <laughs> Well, you know, I know people are really busy and that they may need to just turn to the to the quick take on how you handle a difficult conversation. And, you know, you can read the whole chapter, but, the, you know, I, I know that you might just need the summary bullet points, you know, well, <laughs> just possibly. Well, what I love about the summary bullet points is that I do read the full chapter, but the summary bullet points allow that refresh to to remind me of what I just read. And I think it, it anchors it in more. So from that yeah. perspective, that's what I really love about the structure of the book and the way that the book is going. So oh, thank you. I did yeah. try to walk my own talk in thinking about how to structure it because I do know that, I mean, the research is really clear on the fact that if you take a, even just a second or two to step back and reflect on what it is you've just learned, you actually have much higher recall and much more insight that's gained from the experience. So that's a little bit of what I was trying to do with each chapter, you know, I, I think you were successful. So <laughs> there you go. So you are so intentional. I'm sorry. It's just amazing how intentional you are. I'm sorry, Kurt. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I love that about you. Um, so, so in in the book, you talked about uh, you, you brought up Kahneman and thinking fast and slow, and you talked about uh, his use of System Two versus System One, and you you relabeled that to deliberate and automatic, um, which I think is actually brilliant, um, and we can talk about that for a little bit, but. When you think about that, why did you? Why do you think it's important that that we need both? Because that's a key piece of what you bring up in the book. That both are really important parts of our thinking. Right. Well, you know, one of the reasons I renamed it from System One and System Two to the automatic and deliberate systems is because I could never remember which one was which. I have a little, <laughs> little trick. And, you know, of course, that is that is uh, your your system two, your slow system, your deliberate system, having to work really hard. And so I thought, well, you know, let's make it just a little bit easier for the, for the brain's deliberate system. Um, so, yes, we have these two systems and they are working in tandem beautifully all the time, every day, keeping us, uh, keeping us focused focus on the things that matter. And, you know, the, the reason that we need both is because we need to do our, our best and highest thinking, our careful reasoning, the, the sort of mindful weighing of pros and cons and so on that, uh, that, that, that system two, or as I would call it, the deliberate, the deliberate system, mm -hmm. everything we do deliberately takes care of. Um, and we need the automatic system to automate kind of almost everything else, because otherwise our poor deliberate system gets tired very quickly and gets overloaded very easily. So what's happening is that it's a bit like, you know, your, your deliberate system is the super, super clever professor, but, you know, gets overloaded very, very easily. And the automatic system is the hyper efficient assistant who most, <laughs> mostly, mostly is amazing and fantastic, just occasionally takes shortcuts that might be not quite so smart. But, you know, mostly we're very grateful to the assistant. I love, well, you know, oh, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think Kurt's system one never is, is out of line. Kurt's <laughs> system, you know, is Con perfect. You know, it's always his automatic system is flawless. Perfectly right? if I just want to eat chocolate all day. There you go. Oh. Um, Caroline, why uh, this is a, uh, you know, since we've had this conversation from our first conversation back, I've been thinking about this and I'm like, going, why do you think Kahneman? And, and I don't know if you can answer this or just have an opinion on it, it, it with all of his his 
brains and, and the insights that he has, I find that it's very true that system one and system two are not intuitive to how we would actually do it. And from a framing perspective, automatic, deliberate, you could probably come up with a multitude of other uh, naming nomenclatures for, naming cultures for this. Did I just say that wrong? Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I think you totally muffed it, I, but that's okay. No, no, that, I mean, was, right. that was my system one going on. Yeah. But you're I, absolutely right. I mean, you know, cognitive neuroscientists have called the, you know, they have a different name for the two system process, which is uh, the X system and the, and the C system. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, I think that we've been struggling with what to call these things for a little time, a little, little while. And of course, you know, John Haidt calls it the, the elephant and the rider. And that's really evocative. Yeah. Uh, I like that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was a big fan of, of, of Jonathan's uh, approach with the with the elephant and the writer for a long time. But I, I have to admit, I'm totally onto automatic and deliberate. I feel like that is really uh, more succinct and more um, effective way of talking about it to people and to say, you know, our the, our deliberate decision making or our automatic decision making seems to make more sense. I, and, and I'm wondering, are you finding that? Are you getting good responses yeah. from people? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's funny because a lot of people will say deliberative instead of deliberate. I, I don't mind that. I mean, you know, if the whole idea is that, you know, what you're doing deliberately is, is handled by that system and what you're doing automatically is handled by the other system. And, you know, um, I did have a conversation with uh, with Daniel Kahneman about uh, about the two systems, and he said that if he were to rewrite uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, he might bring out the hero aspect of the automatic system a little bit more mm. fully, um, because you know you really do need both of them. You just need to understand the weaknesses, the the little you know the, the little quirks of each system, and then you can really go with the grain of how your brain works. So you know you need to understand your deliberate system gets tired easily, can only do one thing at a time, uh, you know can only take in a certain amount of information, and you need to understand that your automatic system takes shortcuts, and sometimes those shortcuts are amazing and sometimes they lead you to do silly things right. and if you can understand <laughs> that the more tired and overloaded your deliberate system is the more likely it is your automatic system will be in charge you know you're gonna you're gonna make much more mindful choices about how you spend your day and how you interact with people how familiar are you with the research from antonio damasio what he did on that where he took his yeah. medical um patients that had a debilitating brain injury or some lesions on their brain that actually impacted that automatic system uh, and that emotional response and found that yeah. those people, I mean, they, they couldn't even decide which restaurant to choose. So yeah. It's a really, I, I, I actually channel that a little bit when I'm running workshops on the topic and I'm just introducing the idea, right? I get people to think about if your deliberate system were in charge of choosing a restaurant, then, you know, how would you do that? If you would, you know, sometimes we are very, very deliberate about where we go uh, for lunch, but most of the time we don't build an exhaustive spreadsheet of every restaurant that is possibly reachable on a given day and then code multiple columns of attributes and then weight, <laughs> weight the scores. Can you imagine? I mean, if we actually made small decisions like that, it would be absolutely paralyzing. Uh, and that is, of course, you know, what Damasio's research showed. And it's a really nice way of saying, you know what, it's not a question of your deliberate system being smart and your automatic system being stupid. It is a question of using each system for the purpose that it's best at. Are you aware of it? Do you, do you make conscious decisions now, given the amount of research and, and work that you've done in, in this field? Uh, are you conscious of saying, no, 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 I, I actually want to get out of my automatic and be deliberate about this? Or? Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I had a few filters for what went in the book. And you know, one was that uh, I had to only use uh, techniques that I could really, really, truly back up with replicated science. Um, but another was that I had to only use, put stuff in the book that I actually use myself, you know? I don't want to be one wow. of those people who gives advice and then doesn't take it themselves. So that took out quite a lot of... <laughs> quite a lot of content. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, the stuff that I talk about in the book, I, I have this section on cross-check routines and how you can, um, you know, just when you're making a, a, a really important choice that you slow yourself down and say, okay, uh, you know, you might say, what does, uh, you know, what you might, might sort of adopt a devil's advocate and imagine in your mind who would be, who would be likely to argue against this. And I think about what would they say 
to me right now. And I don't necessarily have to take on board what they're saying, but just the very fact of slowing down and asking myself really, you know, it really makes a big difference. And I do that especially when I'm annoyed. Mm. <laughs> Because when I'm annoyed, I know that there's less activity in my prefrontal cortex. And so I know that the, it's time to kind of just notice that I'm aggravated, step away, <laughs> and then, you know, just, just come back with a, with a fresh pair of eyes. And so, you know, frankly, if you did nothing else but that, that would be, uh, that would be helpful. Tim, if we followed that advice, we, we would never be able to write a book because we don't follow any of our own <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's that's you know spoiler alert. <laughs> no book coming out from Tim and Kurt in any anytime soon, uh, in any near future. So, Caroline, you started your your career as a research fellow at the Levy Economic Institute. Help us understand how you transitioned from that into this work that you're doing now. Well. When I was an economics student, the Berlin Wall came down, and wow. that seemed, I know. Wow. No, no, I'm not out of time, but, but I mean, what is yeah. momentous? Wow, she's so no. old. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, you're taking it the wrong way. No, no, I mean, just like that's so, such a momentous experience. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And and so, you know, as an as a sort of uh, fledgling economist, I just thought this has to be the most interesting thing that any economist could ever yeah. want to, to look yeah, at, totally. to think about. I wasn't quite right about that because obviously not everybody thought that, you know, they should they should spend their lives studying it. But for me, that was just absolutely fascinating because it brought together mm, you know it wasn't just economics uh, per se it was politics and psychology and, and my, my interests were always you know in that sort of broader sense of you know how do human beings thrive and come together and and uh, and, and function at their best and so you know those first few years of my professional life uh, I was focused on the changes in Central and Eastern Europe and I spent a year um, researching that uh, I was based at the Levy Institute, but I spent a good bit of the year on the ground in, in Prague. And then I spent a couple of years in public policy as a public policy economist, um, helping the British government give support to the region. So, you know, that was building um, stock exchanges and, and figuring out how to actually have central banks. And uh, after years of not really having any of those sorts of institutional um, structures. And I just loved the combination of the fact that there was an enormous um, an enormous shift that was going on at a macro level, but there were at a small everyday level, there were tiny changes that each individual was having to make, actually big changes that each individual was having to make. And I think that was what seeded my interest uh, in personal change. You know, I saw societies that had to absolutely turn on a, on a dime on in terms of what they valued and what they uh, what they pursued. And I, I think that although I then went on to do public policy work in other areas, and then I went into management consulting and focused on organizational change and, you know, really the seeds of interest in what I, I did were planted back then, you know, in the, uh, late eighties and early nineties. So I've always been interested in, in human change. Uh, it's just that the canvas on which I've been interested in it has, sh has shifted over the years. Does that make sense? Totally. And um, I think it's so interesting it reminds me of Coleman's boat, you know, the, the, the uh, Coleman's idea of, of sociological change, you know, at the macro level, influencing the micro level change and vice versa. Yeah. How individual changes influence the, 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 the community and how the community influences the, uh, the individual. Yeah. And uh, right. I mean, it's almost it, it, it almost sounds like your fascination was at least at first sociological. Yeah. I, I think, you know, my first economics teacher when I was 16 was I didn't realize it, but he wasn't really teaching us economics. He was uh, <laughs> he was really uh, teaching us to be critical thinkers about human behavior. Wow. And uh, you know, we only just barely managed to get through the uh, the examination because he wasn't really teaching to the curriculum. But, um, <laughs> but he, he taught us, you know, to think philosophically, politically, psychologically, and as you say, sociologically. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, when I went into management consulting, my interest was getting closer to that again, you know, that, that human dimension. And initially I was working on these huge projects, you know, huge cultural change projects at, uh, large organizations. And then over time, I just, again, found that it was down to individual 
leaders and managers and the, the, the behaviors that they showed to the world day in, day out had such a disproportionate impact on the people around them and then the changes that they, they were trying to make that I became more and more interested in that, in the small stuff, let's say, the everyday stuff and the individual stuff. Do you find more joy out of working? Because you, you, you have done these massive projects that influence you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, as well as the workshops where you're working with very small groups. Yeah. Do you, do you find more joy in the smaller groups? Do, is there more personal benefit to you in that? Well, I think I, I came to understand over the years that although I have a technical background and I, you know, I, I was, I did like math, you know, it was, I, I was really into all of that stuff. Actually, my, my strengths really lie particularly in the, in the inter, interpersonal uh, space. And so, yeah, I think, you know, that was a big personal journey for me to actually recognize that and then lean into it. Um, over time. And, you know, when I was at McKinsey, the consulting firm, I was very lucky because, you know, I, I initially, when I first joined, they just wanted me to do extremely technical work. And I kept on saying, no, I really want to do the people stuff. And then eventually they, they let me have a go. <laughs> and, um, Thank and, and then I didn't really look back, but they allowed me to experiment and push and build actually quite an innovative practice in behavioral change. And yeah, you know, I, I did find over time that I got more and more energy from the face to face the, the the sort of deeply deeply personal and so i had to think quite carefully about who i work with you know so that i'm helping the right people have a you know strong positive impact on the world but the reason for writing the book was because as my work became more intimate i thought wow you know it wouldn't it be nice if i could still have a, a wider way of, of of reaching people so the book was was a way of of doing that um and i'm i'm so delighted i did it even though it was the hardest thing i've ever done yeah Oh, okay. Wow. Well, I, I think so too. I'm sorry, Kirk, go ahead. But I just, I just want, I have to just say, I'm glad you wrote it because I think that it really, it really gets right down to the very specific deliverables that it seems to me that virtually anybody can pick up the book and benefit from it. Oh, thank you. I, yeah. I think it's terrifically thank written. You. That's really what I was trying to do. I, yeah, I was really trying to make it accessible to anybody who has um, kind of aspiration to, to be at their best more often and an ability or an interest in, in the evidence behind it, right? I mean, I, it, that doesn't require formal education, but it does re require a little bit of a curious mind. Uh, so I was writing for that person for sure. Yeah. So let's, let's get into some of the details in the book, because in the book, one of the things you talk about is setting goals and how important setting goals are. But you actually bring two traits into that, where you talk about setting personal goals and then setting specific goals. So help our listeners understand the difference between those two and how they impact each other. Hmm. Well, you know, all of us have to-do lists that are, you know, long, long, very long. And, you know, we don't <laughs> always feel that we get to the end of them. You know, I, I, saw, Never. I remember actually talking to um, a colleague who is getting very stressed about not being able to complete his to-do list each day. And I said, you know, welcome to the world that there's a point of maturity in your career where you get to the point where you cannot possibly finish everything that's on your list, you know, and, and embrace that. That is, that is, uh, that is the reality of, uh, of growing up. So <laughs> luckily he didn't punch me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. But, um, but yeah, you know, we, we are, perpetually feeling like there's more that we should be doing so how do we how do we manage that um there's definitely some stuff that's on our list usually that we're not super excited about and so there i think it's helpful to uh harness the research on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation because we know that if you can find some kind of personal why Mm -hmm. um you know behind even the most annoying work you will perform better, be more creative, be more likely to do your best with it. And, you know, sometimes it's when you're sort of, you've been delegated a task and it's really not what you wanted to spend time on. Uh, you know, asking yourself who's going to ultimately benefit from this, you know, results initially in a pretty sarcastic response, or at least it does <laughs> for a Brit like me. Uh, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, who's going to benefit from this? Ultimately, my boss. My boss is going to benefit from this. Yay. Uh -huh. um, but you know, if you can push beyond that and, and actually push to say, okay, now who ultimately is going to benefit if I get this work right? 
uh, you know, maybe you know, maybe it it leads to the leaders of your organization making better choices, and that means that customers, uh, you know, benefit from having a better range of products, or you know, better customer service, or you know, maybe if you're not so excited about serving customers, maybe there's something about the sustainability of the company. So if there's something on your to-do list that is not particularly exciting to you, it's really helpful to harness the evidence uh, around intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Because it turns out that if you are doing something that is deeply meaningful to you, you will perform better in general against, you know, any kind of complex or interesting task. As long as it's not a super basic task, you'll perform better if you feel that it's somehow worthwhile, as opposed to something that's just uh, pursuing externally conferred status. Maybe it's something that's been delegated to you by a boss and you're just ticking a box. So the trick is then to think about, well, how can I make this extremely annoying thing that has been delegated to me by my boss, something that feels really personal? And there, you know, really, just a couple of simple questions that are going to help you. It might be, um, you know, who is ultimately going to benefit from this piece of work being done well? You know, maybe it's a colleague, maybe it's the team, maybe it's a customer. Um, And you can also work it back for the other way around and say, well, what is it that I really care about? What really motivates me? What do I... What am I excited about? And how, how does this task in some way speak to that? And there was a guy that I ran into. Uh, I was coaching a hospital CEO for a while. And he was new in role. And he was uh, doing a walk around the hospital before anyone really knew his face well. And just to try and get a bit of a sense of what it actually felt like on the ground. Mm-hmm. And he he told a wonderful story about... The, um, the porter in the hospital who was fixing a door, uh, which was apparently squeaking. And the CEO asked this guy, so why are you, you know, why are you doing this? And instead of saying, well, I'm doing it because it's on my to-do list, he said, well, I'm doing it because it's going to help patients. Because every time they go through on a, on a trolley, on a gurney, the door sticks a little bit and it just gives them a really jarring jolt. And it's, that's not very good, is it? If they're ill, you don't want that. And so he had just naturally got this ability to frame it in terms of the benefit to patients. And that's terrific. pretty simple job, I'm sure, to fix the door. But, you know, he will have done it better. He might have seen something else that needed fixing and he will have been more excited about fixing that. Um, and the, 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 it's the same is true for us when we're dealing with perhaps a report that we're not that excited about. Focusing on yeah. what is the benefit is going to make us uh, more intelligent as we do it. And then the other, the other thing you were asking me about was, uh, I think, uh, specifics. Yeah. So yeah. You, had, you talked about personal and specific goal, you know, as the two traits of those of, of a goal, right? And then there's an enormous amount of research on the power of being very specific about what it is that you're trying to do. And, you know, it's not to say that you don't want the big lofty goals that make you feel like life is worth living. We've just talked about the fact that, you know, actually having a clear sense of the personal why of why something is meaningful to you is is really helpful. But often when we think about things that are on our to-do list that sit there for for weeks and sometimes actually years, it's because it's just too big or too vague. And we haven't really been specific enough in thinking about what is the very first small step that I need to take. And if you go back to uh, system one and system two, or the automatic system, the deliberate system, you want to make it as easy as possible for your deliberate system to figure out what it needs to do next. And that's why specific goals tend to get done and vague ones don't. Yeah. You know, I, I was at uh, I, I guest lecture this morning uh, at a local university and was su- surprised that it was in a group of 50 or so uh, juniors and seniors. The way the salespeople articulated their goals were lofty and huge and, you know, sort of the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious mm-hmm. goals. Uh, and and then I, I said, well, what about marketing? Because it was mostly marketing majors and the marketing majors, they they spoke much more specifically about, well, what I'd like to do is get into marketing analytics, or I'd like to, get, you know, they were, they had little bricks size, you know, these very yeah. specific. And I thought that was really interesting. Do you think, so Caroline, do you think there's a difference in the way 
people naturally set goals? Do you think that some people are predisposed to these BHAGs, these, these monstrous lofty goals, and some people are more predisposed to sort of more smaller, uh, more incremental size goals? Yeah, I think that's probably right. And the thing is that if you are a very pragmatic, okay, what is it I do next in the next 10 minutes person, you, you might want to pay a little bit of attention to, well, what am I truly trying to achieve here? What are my bigger, uh, more motivating, more meaningful, bigger picture goals? Because they're going to help you uh, lift your performance when you're dealing with complexity and when you're hitting bumps on the road. On the other hand, if you're the sort of person who's all about the vision, then, you know, actually boiling it down to, okay, yeah, okay, but what do you do this afternoon? And actually specifically, what do you write now? You know, which email do you send? Oh, which email address do you need to actually find so you can send right, that email? Right. Right. You know, so you need that you need that complementarity between the the huge and the tiny in order to really achieve great things. I, I wanted to talk about actually something that is close to Kurt's heart, and that is priming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, reminding yourself to stay on track. And I know that, uh, you know, you admitted to um, Donna Summers uh, being a, <laughs> a, a prime for you. Right. And, yes. uh, and, uh, Kurt, Kurt has actually done a lot of work in priming and he uses socks, uh, as, as, as his primary prime. So maybe the two of you could just compare primes. <laughs> tell us, tell us about your socks, Kurt. Oh, my, the listeners have heard a lot about my, <laughs> I, I definitely wear socks for a very specific purpose of the day. So if I know that I am going to be speaking with clients or doing a presentation where I need to be smart, I will wear my Einstein socks that have pictures of Einstein on them. If I know that day I need to maybe be a little bit more aggressive, uh, I'm, I'm not naturally an aggressive person in a sales situation or in asking people for favors or to do something. I will often wear my shark socks that, that again, prime me <laughs> to be thinking about shark and being more aggressive. So those are the types of uh, and great. Actually many, many pairs of socks that I, I wear on various different occasions. So, and, and what I love about that is, you know, when you think about the priming field, it's obviously been a source of huge controversy. The fact, you know, the idea that if you give people a warm drink, that it'll make them warmer and, and friendlier uh, because of the associations that they have with that warm drink. And I, you know, the, I think the challenge with that research and the reason why there's been, there have been issues with replication is that we don't know what associations are stored in other people's minds. Yes. Uh, so how can we be sure that what we think will prime them to behave in a certain way will actually achieve that. I mean, there's certainly, you know, some things you can imagine that, you know, upbeat songs in a major key will, you know, will, will tend to boost people's mood more than uh, drifty, um, smushy songs in a, in a minor key. But, you know, the thing is that we can only be really sure of our own associations. And if you know that those socks make a huge difference to, to your mood because of the associations you have with it, then, you know, oh my goodness, I think that's the most, the most precise use of enclosed cognition that I think I've ever heard. I love it. So help us understand Donna Summers in you. And I know that it may not be Donna Summers anymore, but how did you use that? And, and what do you use today? So I remember seeing a Blue Man group uh, show and this was years ago back in London when I was still living there and in the finale uh, there was this uh, incredible moment where a lot of stuff happened that was interactive there were things coming down from the ceiling and I just loved the show I was so into it and I just loved the the performance energy of these guys and the song that was playing in the finale was Donna Summer's I Feel Love and so for, and I'm a, I'm a musical person, so music really makes a big difference to me. And so what happened after that was that whenever I heard the song, I thought, wow, yeah. And it reminded me of that moment. And so I started to use that as one of my primes for going on stage or, you know, embarking on something which required a little bit of that performative energy from me uh, to put me in a, in a high energy, uh, a, a, you know, point, um, a state of mind that, that would allow me to kind of perhaps not um, – Perform the gymnastics that the Blue Man Group uh, managed to put on stage. <laughs> oh come on! Yeah, but at oh least, come on! <laughs> at least radiate a little bit of energy. And so, yeah. So I I put that in the book as a as an as an example. And then the uh, Financial Times review of the 
book honed in on that uh, at that fact. And now, of course, <laughs> I get asked about Donna Summer quite a lot. Um, <laughs> often when I'm giving a talk, that will be the song that someone has played as I'm coming on the stage. And, you know, it still works. It still works every time. But I actually have quite a few playlists. I have a, a playlist for workshops that I play every time when I'm setting up the room and I'm waiting for people to arrive that just, you know, gets me into the right state of mind. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty uh, pretty fluid in, in thinking about what playlist is needed for for one particular moment. But you're purposeful in that playlist and how you're actually using that music to, uh, you know, enlighten those neural networks that are going to put you in the state of mind that gets you to the desired outcome that you want. And again, as Tim mentioned, very purposeful in those manners. That's the same way when I think about the socks that I put on in the morning, <laughs> yeah. I'm going, all right, what do I need to do? Yeah. Uh, and it's not just the colorful ones. It's like, if, if there's something specific, now many days I just wear the old black, you know, little socks, but that's, those are just the boring. Oh, days. I totally so, get it. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. you know, actually, and this may be more of a female thing than a male thing. I think, you know, women are often thinking, who do I need to be to get it today? What is it that I need to convey? Because, you know, our outfits are often, you know, that they they're more varied than than men, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, we often dress to think about how we, what is it that we want to convey to to everyone else. But you know, it's it's extremely powerful to think about well, what is it that what mood do I want to be in? What kind of zone do I want to be in, and what's going to actually create that for myself? So I love the fact that you found a way to do that. It's brilliant. Yeah. There you go. Well, my my stepsister in law uh, wears her power pink, you know outfit when she needs to be on and she uh, knows that and, and she knows that it's more of a internal component for her i don't think she's ever associated it with yeah. priming but she definitely does do that so i think there's some validity in what you're talking about from that element because i don't think there's very few men that i would know that say i'm wearing this outfit to convey a certain message to myself um Although that, that I'm, I'm generalizing probably there, and, and who knows? My husband has one specific tie that I gave him. <laughs> he has one but, tie? That's you know, <laughs> yes. Now, <laughs> now, if anyone who knows him is listening, they're going to think, which one is it? Which one is it? I'm not, I'm not going to give that away. <laughs> but but there but he wears that for specific purposes. Yes. Is, yes. Yeah, when yeah. he wants to, when he when he's yeah, when he's wanting to step up his game, and he's really you yeah. know, it's an important meeting. Yeah. So, uh, well, with all that, so do you think priming, uh, so you're not saying that priming doesn't work, of course. I mean, you're, you're saying that priming is effective, but do you think that it's ineffective on a marketing level? Do you think that, that getting back to this idea of trying to appeal to the complexities of, of every individual with their own memories, do you think that that's um, wasted effort? Well, I'm not an expert in marketing, but I, I think that the thing that we can be certain of is our own uh, our own associations. I think the controversies in, in the field of priming research have um, centered on the question of, uh, can you prime other people? And is it conscious or unconscious? And, you know, those are the two big, big yeah. debates, and you know, quite acrimonious debates uh, that are going on. But, um, you know, what you can be sure of is consciously priming yourself on, you know, using, using associations you, you definitely have. Now, you know, can you, can, can you have subliminal influences on people as they, uh, or not even subliminal, can you influence people uh, it, to, to, to to have more warmer feelings towards your product. Of course you can. I mean, that is really what marketing is trying to do. And I think that what behavioral science is, is doing is becoming more precise in how to help um, marketers figure, figure out what those connections, what those aspirations might be. I just know that it's a surer bet to figure out how to prime yourself than it is to prime other people. That makes sense. And I, I don't think that would go counter to like Cialdini's work. I, I think that, you know, I mean, he, he has lots and lots yeah. of examples of uh, very subtle, unconscious primes. But I, I don't think he would say that, that priming ourselves would be, I think he would agree that priming us, ourselves, our individual self yeah. is more effective. And, yeah. and we're, we're going to do better at that. So Caroline, in the, in the book, you talk about, uh, about tiny tweaks, about identifying tiny tweaks that can help you have a better day, better life, uh, you know, things from like multitasking or stopping multitasking, sleep, positive thinking primes, which we just talked about, physical activity, when, if scenarios. Uh, so if you had to say of those, and there's, there's, there's even more, many more of them, but many, yeah. what would you, if you had to give advice to the listeners and saying, look, if there are two or three things 
of, of those tiny tweaks that you think can have the biggest impact on somebody's daily life? Can you, can you call out two or three or is it dependent on the individual? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it is dependent on the individual, but I'll tell you one thing that combines a few different strands of the research that I do every day. And I'm not a very routinized person. So, you know, th- this is this is definitely something which I would say is a no brainer for me. Mm. And it's working something that, as you know, behavioral economists call the peak end effect. And, you know, the way that that works is that we have limited capacity to remember everything that ever happened in our lives. And so we actually don't remember every aspect of every experience. Actually, when we look back at the quality of an experience, we tend to remember the most intense moment and the end. So, you know, the way we think about the quality of this podcast and no pressure, right? But we've got to end on a real high note is it's going to be the average of the most intense moment and the way it ends. And so, you know, that is something that we know about the way that our memory works. And so, you know, when you get to the end of a day, that's maybe not been great yeah, how on earth do you end on a high? Well, you can end on a high uh, and, you know, knowing that that's going to disproportionately affect the way you remember the day by thinking about what was it that went well today, even if it was mostly a pretty crappy day. Mm. Uh, and just forcing yourself, perhaps forcing is too dramatic a word, but, you know, really encouraging yourself to think about, okay, well, you know, there was that moment. I, I actually remembered my umbrella today. That was kind of, that was good. <laughs> or, you know, I, I got to that meeting on time, even though the traffic was terrible. Or... You know, there was that moment when someone actually smiled or helped me out. And if you if you don't stop to remember, you will likely forget. And and, and by ending your day with uh, with this kind of uh, reflection, it combines a lot of research on gratitude. It combines some research on uh, on, on the peak end effect, uh, and it also combines in the research on selective attention. Because unless you direct your attention to something deliberately, then there's a good chance you're going to forget it. And so that starts to rewrite the history, starts to rewrite the story of how you think about your life. So, so do you have to do that at the end of the day, or can it be? I'm thinking your days kind of parceled out into different aspects of it. So at the end of your work day, is there value in doing that same thing about what you just did at work and thinking about that and then going maybe, you know, at the end of the day, again, doing it again at the end of the day? Is there is there value in doing it multitudes of times during that day at different breaks? That's a great question. Yeah, I would say, yeah, this is a bit fractal, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, actually, at the end of each meeting, how nice is it if you actually say, you know what, that was uh, that was great. Here are the things that I'm going to take away from this and that I really appreciated. And, you know, how even better if you can get everybody to, to share their own version of that. At the end of a conversation, if you say, you know, it was really great talking to you. I really liked hearing about X, Y, Z. Just taking a moment to, to recap and think what was great about that at the end of each major experience, at the end of each working day. Yeah, it really makes a difference to how you start to think about the quality of those experiences and that really adds up and you you did that with your book as we talked about at the very beginning of this with the bullet points at the end of each chapter in, in kind of providing a a you know shortcut for people to say here are the highlights here are these peak things from this chapter that you can now remember and now it's at the end and it brings that back into mind so i think there's probably a lot of different yeah. ways to incorporate that peak end rule into your life. Um, and I think to, to your point, I think that it brings in a lot of different aspects uh, from a lot of the different psychological and behavioral science research. Yeah, so. absolutely. Cool. I love that. I love it. Okay. So we started out by talking a little bit about Carnegie Hall versus Carnegie Deli, <laughs> which, you know, cause you're in New York, but let's talk about, I'm really, I'm really curious about your, your musical interest interests and how is it that you came to be in a choir that performs at Carnegie Hall twice a year. Honestly, I mean, I'd like to get that gig, but, uh, but also just, uh, t- this must go back a while. T- how, yeah. did, how did you get started in the musical? Well, thing? you know, both my grand grandfathers were, were very musical. Actually, I, I, one of my grandmothers was as well. And I started playing the piano, bashing the piano next to my grandfather at you know, the age of three or so. Um, and then, you know, pian- piano, piano, piano was the big thing in my life, apart from, uh, apart from everything, well, <laughs> apart from everything else that was a big thing in my life. Sport was a big thing. Studies were a big thing. But, you know, piano was my sort of very personal retreat. And, uh, you know, it was a huge part of my life. I did all of, you know, all of the kind of formal musical training um, that, that you can do. And I did a, a music 
music as part of my baccalaureate. And, um, and then I realized I couldn't carry a piano around with me. And actually, <laughs> it wasn't always easy to get access to a piano. And so then I started singing a lot more and discovered that that's something you can actually, you know, carry with you at any moment. <laughs> so much yes, more possible, it's very much more possible. Yeah, but I've I've been in and out of bands and choirs, you know, basically since you know since I was about fourteen. And um, like like what kind of bands know, were it punk bands? Oh goodness, terrible bands. <laughs> 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 no, I mean you know when I was a kid, uh, you know we'd form a band, and I was still, as I say, mostly on keyboards. I sort of you know migrated gradually to to singing backing and backup, and then you know uh, from there started to sort of come a little bit more to the front. But yeah, I I just you know we used to cover pop songs, right? I mean that's how you kind of learn your chops when you're first starting. Right, um, right. And then I got into jazz, and then I discovered that I was a better jazz singer than I was a jazz pianist, and wow. so that was one of the things that tipped me a little bit towards singing. Wow, that's that's a great realization. I wish I was a better jazz singer than I was jazz player <laughs> personally, but because I was listening to Ella Fitzgerald recently, and oh my gosh, she just she always just sends chills up my spine. Okay, but how did you get to how did we get to Carnegie Hall from playing? Practice, practice, practice. Obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Lots yeah. of it, but <laughs> but but come on. Yes. I mean, a lot of people practice and still don't get to Carnegie Hall. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so my husband also sings and, uh, we moved to New York from London, um, a few years ago, about, uh, about three years ago, I was spending a lot of time here before that, but actually, you know, got my green card and, and, you know, was allowed into the country properly at that point. And, um, he reconnected with a conductor that he had loved singing with years earlier and always said that he'd learned more from this guy than from anyone else. And, and so he has this, this chorus called the Cecilia chorus. And, uh, it is just fantastic. It's a, it's a mix of, uh, oh, and obviously there's a, there's a step in the middle there where we both auditioned and then, you know, got into the chorus. Okay, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> a, minor, yeah. a, l- a minor little uh, thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, it's, it's a, I, I love it because it is, you know, we do a lot of the big classical pieces, but we also commission new work and we, we sort of surface work that's been a little bit uh, neglected. So our programs are always really interesting. And um, wow. yeah, and we're doing, we're doing Handel's Messiah at Carnegie Hall wow. on December 8th. So. What, yes. what a fabulous piece of vocal music. Oh my yes, God. Absolutely. Yeah, just absolutely amazing. Yes. Okay. So, so uh, I, I think that that's so, so cool, but your musical instruments are, our interests are very wide. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, singing jazz to, to, to the classical, the serious music, that's, that's a wide. Oh, this, it goes a lot wider. I used to be part of this uh, huge pop chorus, uh, in London and we used to do arrangements of pop songs about 300 strong and we'd perform in clubs. So no, I mean, it goes wider and, and, you know, the music I tend to listen to uh, a lot at home is a lot of instrumental deep house and, and EDM. So no, I, I <laughs> the, the, the tastes go a little broader than, than we've talked about so far. <laughs> oh man, this Kurt, I'm sorry. We're going to have to schedule another podcast. Guess, just to talk about music with Caroline. <laughs> this would be so much fun. Oh man. I mean, the fact that you can say EDM and classical and pop chorus, like in the same <laughs> sentence and all have it apply to you. I'm, I'm down. I'm so down with that. <laughs> oh, well, Caroline, thank you. This has been, I think, very informative and, and just fun. And uh, we appreciate you taking time to record again. So thank you for all of that. And thank you for the wonderful insights. Oh, it's such a huge pleasure. I could talk to you guys all day. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's let's do it again. I think it would. I think it would be. That would be a good day, right? Yeah, it would be a good day because today is a well, good this day. Is the so. peak when I look back on today, this will definitely be that peak memory. Here we go. So that's right. Yeah. So thank you so much, Caroline, and we uh, we hope to connect with you again soon. Likewise. Thank you. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our Behavioral Grooves interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our blown minds. We were blown away. We were. We were blown away with this interview. It was was, so much fun. It was amazing. So, all right, let's get down to the the brass nuts or bolts, brass... I think brass tacks. Brass tacks. That's... See, this is why you are so important <laughs> to this podcast, Tim. You correct all of my my bad <laughs> analogies. With... You remember all the people that I forget. It's just it, it you know. It's, hey, it's... Like, language is dynamic. Didn't haven't we learned that? So if you wanted to call it the brass buttons or the the brass switches or the brass the, hardware or or the copper something or other copper cups i don't know it could be whatever it is <laughs> we'll, we'll go with it anyway tell me what you liked about this interview with caroline what were some of the mm. the, the top 
uh, things that we learned? There was so much. There was, this was a jam-packed uh, conversation. And maybe, maybe one of the most important things was, as simple as it is, the, the labeling of System 1 and System 2 thinking as automatic and deliberate. <sighs> it's just so easy to grasp automatic thinking and deliberate thinking. I, it is so true. It's one of those components that I wonder why, again, and we asked her about this, like, why Danny Kahneman is a smart, smart, smart guy. Yeah, way. And yet he came up with System 1 and System 2. It's the same thing that I, I still to this day cannot tell you, type 1 error or type 2 error, which one is the false positive which and which is, is the, the false, false negative. negative. I, yeah. I have to look it up every single time. Labeling that thinking automatically, that system one thinking, is, you know, labeling it automatic is just wonderful. Right. Um, and and then she went on to say, and, to, to, and, and I think you know, Kahneman, I think you've mentioned that Kahneman actually started with this, that our, our automatic thinking is a, can be the hero. Right. We and have that, to stop bashing our system one thinking. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. It is really vital right. to to how we operate in this world it is the component and again we brought up this with the antonio damasio uh right com right component the, the, right? That's right that when people actually lose the ability of their system one that emotional trigger that they have it blows up the rest of their life they can't make a decision they can't figure out what restaurant to go to can't tonight. decide what it's restaurant too hard it's too hard we need both our, our the way we've evolved we have evolved to use both so and it helped us it saved us from the tigers 40,000 years ago and it helps us decide what restaurant to go to tonight i think it's a pretty good combination <laughs> <laughs> but the 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 thing that i think is important about this um and, and we didn't get into this with Caroline, is really it's understanding how the two work together. Right, and right. and for us as people, as humans who are operating in a world that doesn't have too many tigers left in it, uh, at least not ones that are not behind bars or in cages that we run into on a everyday yeah. basis, it is those interactions with system one and system two that we have to understand when is system one being helpful and when is system one actually leading us down the wrong path and i think caroline in her book talks about that and really helps in, in doing that i don't know if we got so much into it with uh the conversation just a footnote i actually think there is a tiger problem in new delhi there, literally, because the tigers are coming in from the forest because development is pushed out so much that they're getting used to people and they come in and it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. Wow. Okay, so our, our listeners in India might be going, hey, don't <laughs> forget about us because it's know, kind of a big deal. And and I, I apologize. I am a very myopic uh, U.S. It's, citizen. Context and matters, man. Context, context matters. Context yes, matters. it does. Okay, so, what else? What else struck you, Kurt? Well, I think there were uh, a, a number of things to, to think about. The extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation component, yeah. right? That element of the why. And really the getting into why, right? that personal why. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really, well, we do knew this or uh, know this um, from the work that we do in incentives is you can have an extrinsic motivation and they're very powerful. I yeah. am not discounting yeah. the power that extrinsic motivation has, but we know for sustained long term change, intrinsic motivation, you know, far outshines extrinsic motivation usually uh, in the long term especially when it comes to actually behavioral change right exactly yeah but i loved how she she uh, caroline really focused on this idea of um what do i care about and then the um the example she gave of the hospital employee mm -hmm. who was fixing the doors for the benefit of the patients right uh, making that you know, uh, Kivitz used to talk about the the virtuous aspect of our work. Mm -hmm. That anybody, that someone even working in a toy store, selling batteries to a parent right before a birthday or a holiday, could find something virtuous in that, so that the child get, receiving the toy is going to have batteries and it's going to work. Right. And there's something virtuous in that. And I think it's it's important to know that that's not easy. 
that was the one thing, you know, just yeah. because, and we talked a little bit about, you know, the boss giving you a goal and now you go, oh, why is that important? Because the boss is going to be, you know, good for it and, and the, it does really good for the company. And just the fact of trying to make it virtuous or bringing it back to the patient or bringing it back to the customer is not an easy thing to do. Right. But if you can do that, if you can internalize it, then that really makes uh, an important component and really helpful in driving that, that long-term change. Okay, Tim, what else? Uh, the tiny tweaks discussion, uh, the peak end effect. Okay. Like this is, uh, it's so easy to forget that our memories aren't this perfect video reconstruction of what happened, right? We're remembering, we're remembering bits and pieces. Right. We've had this discussion many times. Right? right. That in fact, we even frame some of our discussions about, do you remember this? Or no, this is the way I think I remember it, but I'm not <laughs> sure if that's what happened. Right? Well, but that's a good way of actually talking about memory because again, for most of us, we remember the what we've remembered what we've remembered. It's this, uh, <laughs> right, it's, it's the photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. And so the, the clarity it, of that it, memory, it, it gets gross, it gets degraded. Yeah. So that element I think is really important to think about, but yes, peak end rule, go back to the peak end rule. Yeah. So I, I, um, so if, if we have this peak end effect in our memories, why not end on a high? Like, why not end the day on a high? Why not end our discussions on a high? Why not end our interactions? Why not uh, end our, our personal reflections about our day on a high? I think that's just brilliant. You know, I think so, just, too. There's, I mean, that's something that we, just about anybody can apply. The we, whole component of ending your day with that gratitude, reflection component of that, but then even applying that into different situations end of a meeting, reflect, make sure that it's that high point, you know, and, and specifically building in to your day areas that you know are going to have some positive effect. Uh, make them vivid, make, make them memorable. Them vivid. Yeah. But building in, you know, you really like to, to exercise. So let's build that exercise into, you know, uh, ending of a certain part of your day that you can reflect back on, or you love to read. Well, maybe you should, instead of watching television at the end of the day, spend 30 minutes reading because now you have that, that end peak. You could be reading how to have a good day. You could just, be reading just, how to have just FYI. a good day, which you know? would be a really good thing to do. It is. So therefore, you should do that, it people. Is. What there else, Kurt? What else, what else struck you? Um, I mean, there was so much. There was so much. I, I think, again, the piece that was interesting for me, and this is more of a general concept, Caroline was applying behavioral science principles into our everyday life. Yeah. Not just in how we yeah. work with you know, companies and trying to sell more things to consumers, not in uh, setting policy from this grand scale of government. It was about taking some of these scientific principles and applying them into the everyday acts that we do as human beings. And, and she covered a wide variety of those. Covered a wide variety of those and gave yeah. really applicable ways of implementing some of those yeah, actionable actionable yeah. elements and the fact that we all want to have a better day we all want to be yeah. happier in our life we all want to do it reminds me of um who did we just see in new york that was talking about um the five her her course this is why we need you to remember uh, L L names. Uh, Lori, Lori santos yes from yale from yale but she has a course on... Coursera uh, course, yeah. A Coursera course that you can go out and take. But it is a course about um, psychology and happiness. Of well-being. Well-being. Yeah. Uh, but again, she brings up these similar points in applying behavioral science and psychology into making our world, our life, happier. And she does it with college students who have a whole component of... 
uh, what surprised me in, in her talk on that was just yeah. how depressed college kids are. And Dys- I'm like, dysfunction, depression, my yeah. gosh, anxiety, yeah. a variety of different things. Um, where you kind of go, they're 19 year olds. What they they have, they're at Yale. Yeah, they're at Yale. They should have the world on the uh, you know. But but they don't. Yes, they don't. Yeah. Anyway, with that, I think it's really important, and I think Caroline does a really great job of bringing these insights into a uh, very actionable manner that really are helping people. And so I would love to be able to do that. Hopefully, you know, we do some of that on the podcast, but I don't think we're doing we it. We can only dream. <laughs> <laughs> dream on, my man. All right. I, it's time for music. I know you're going to go there. Well, so, so... So I have a question for you. Oh, really? I know. I know. You hate this when this happens. <laughs> I kind of do. So, so, <laughs> are we um, going to have a lecture on the history of music today? <laughs> <laughs> no, we already did that. Uh, so Caroline was originally from U- the UK. Mm-hmm. Now she lives in New York. Yeah. What UK and New York groups, bands, singers, artists uh, come to mind when you think of like the epitome of either a British band or, or performer wow. or wow. UK or New York. Well, uh, she's not from London, so I'm not going to choose a London band. Oh, you know, I'm actually going to choose a specific well, UK. I'm choose a, 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 a band from Liverpool, but not. What? There is only one band from Liverpool. No, no. The Hollies were from ah, Liverpool. The Hollies. And, and so I, I that um and yes, this is, you know, from the nineteen sixties, but man, they uh Graham Nash and uh Gene Clark were absolutely pioneers in uh, their harmonies and their work in uh, in rock and roll. And then uh on this side of the pond, I would say the New York band that comes to my mind first is the Talking Heads. Yep. They're a great band. Oh my gosh, just amazing! Yes, amazing, yes. So, amazing sound, amazing on so many levels. David well, Byrne I mean, and his, his just, compatriots. I, I I look at the Talking Heads, or I listen to the Talking Heads, and think about their music was just. I mean, it took this punk component, but yet it had a pop sensibility to Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and Absolutely. they combined those two and Perfectly. really just did a wonderful job. Okay, so. how about how about for you? What 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 what's your the epitome of your British band. Oh, the British band. Well, I won't go back to the 60s because that's well before my time. Oh. <laughs> I will go to the 80s, which is my <laughs> era, right. right? When you, the formative, you know, high school, college years. Um, and, and, and I go with a, a couple of them. It's, you know, Depeche Mode, The yeah. Cure, yeah. Um, and New Order. Those three, my little synth rock bands, are the epitome for me of what that that British sound was, at least for the 80s. Okay. And really then, love uh, those. And then what about New York? Ramones. And again, I just, oh, yeah. I, you know, when I think about New York bands or New York musicians, um, yeah, I might go. Um, what about Velvet Underground or New York Dolls? Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. But. You asked what was the okay, epitome, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. And they didn't have three for New York; it just had one. Beastie Boys, would that be would that be too too late for you? Yeah, no, just n- n- not your cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> not my cup of tea. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, that ended uh, a completely uh, useless we're, conversation. We're about supposed music. to end on a peak. We should end on a high note. So be happy that we have introduced the names of musical groups that everyone already knows. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yes. And and with that peak, even a better peak, go out and just have so much fun writing a great review for us on iTunes oh, yeah. or other podcast listener, or just share this uh, with somebody that you think would find it interesting. Yeah, please. We appreciate that. We certainly do. But please share it with a friend. That would be terrific today. Adios. <laughs>